Before we meet our guest today, it is important to remember that people with housing instability doesn't make them subhuman. I myself have been homeless three times due to abuse, violence, and rejection. And even though I've always done right by others, I've been wronged and needed to find a shelter and a place that affirms me. Here today is another queer activist, Sky Adrian, also experienced living in the shelter system and has turned his challenges into empowering others in the fight for stable housing for all queer youth. Thank you for coming to Queer Justice today. You're most welcome. Um, so before we start, I just want to let the audience know a little bit about who you are. Sky Adrian currently serves as an independent youth activist for LGBTQ youth homelessness, HIV prevention, and youth immigration services. As an immigrant, he was formerly homeless in New York City and has first-hand experience with DYCD, HUD funded systems and service providers. Through his several trainings and sensitization, he possesses skills in public speaking, group facilitation, meeting and forum planning through agencies such as Ali Forney Center, Vocal NY, Fierce, the LGBT Center, and New Alternatives. Sky also co-chairs several youth lead boards, such as Ending the Epidemic Youth Adult Advisory Board. So Sky, so first off, what pronouns you go by? So I use he, him, and his pronouns. And I'm gonna go by they, them today. Thank you. So, no, thank you. Um, so first question. It makes sense why you got involved with this line of work, but where have you found the empowerment to having struggled with homelessness? In this particular moment, it was about privilege. And the simple fact that I came from a country that's like, you know, everyone's, you know, black. When I came here, I kind of realized that I was disadvantaged in like many ways. So not even, you know, homelessness was one aspect, but then being an immigrant was another aspect. And then on a daily, you know, look at it, it was like my color of my skin became like another layer of barriers. So I think one of my motivation was how was I going to be able to make money to sustain myself and what it is that I was going to do to like get the petition for me to file for my citizenship. So it was that kind of stuff that kind of motivated me because I realized how much like barriers and boxes I was facing in that like particular moment, especially in 2015 when I arrived. I needed to like do a certain level of task, like a certain amount of task. And that was just, you know, like getting my immigration work paper started so that I could at least get a work authorization to, you know, start working, you know, and being able to get money. But then also like another major issue was the, you know, having the level of support that you would need in order to like get that done. And I think that was another great person, um, Cole Gioni, who was formerly the director of like advocacy and evaluation and training at the Ali Forney Center. They were the ones that introduced me into youth advocacy and kind of pushed me and said, this is something that you should capitalize on. This is something that you should um, invest your time in while it is that you're trying to get your papers together. And I think that was one of the best decisions that I could have made, like out of just like getting up and leaving Jamaica. That was like, like the most influential moment, like when that started. And did you have to leave Jamaica because you weren't accepted for who you are? Is that, you know, that there's that one aspect of it of being accepted, but you know, the whole point was like if it is that you did not fit like, you know, these binaries in addition to like Christian like influenced binaries. How when is I think it for queer Jamaicans. It's it's terrible, I think. Um, I mean it seems to be getting better, but I mean, at the rate to which that it's getting better as opposed to it getting worse, it's not very far. It's like kind of close. But queer Jamaicans, are they all living in the gully? Which people oh might no. not know is like an underground, how would you describe it? Under a sewer, right? Like it's really it's bad. It's basically, um, so that is what, that's the closest thing to a shelter, a closest thing to a safe space, ironically. Like the closest thing to a place where you could just be and not be worried about being attacked, despite the fact that it was in the gully. It was, you know, where everything goes when they go down the toilet, or everything goes when it's garbage, you know? So that's basically what they were living in and living among, but that was the only place that they could actually be themselves and be it's who they ironic, are. kind of ironic, because society treats us like garbage. You know, it's mm -hmm. just that they're like literally living in it. And that would basically be the only option that you'd have, you know, outside of like, you know, sexual exploitation, but like, that would be the only option you'd have providing your parents kicked you out or you're trans identified because trans identified folks make up the largest population of youth that live in that gully because they're simply just not accepted. They're not recognized. They're seen as other. They're seen as like a threat 
in most instances. Do you ever see yourself going back to Jamaica and maybe being a head of social services or doing something to change? I feel like that's kind of, I kind of feel like that's your kind of your journey. I mean, I definitely don't, but what I will say though is I know that there are a few like LGBTQ folks within Canada that's working on changing the policy around the Solomon Act and the buggery law that we still have existing in our country. However, I think my line of work will be around assisting and providing like some kind of funding to allocate like a safe community space or like a brave space where that, you know, they can they can be but still being taught how to be outside and being mm -hmm. like, you know, careful. So I'm thinking of somewhere down the line, maybe like when I'm 40 or like 50, <laughs> like, you, you know, know. And I'm here and to it's support like a new project that is alive, <laughs> you know, right. So what has been your biggest backlash challenges and opposers in fighting for housing and queer justice here in the state? People not really noticing youth homelessness is something serious. I think is like one of the hugest barriers and even deeper to get the people who are currently facing homelessness and within that experience to, like to, to, to be motivated in some way or form to kind of fight against it or to get involved in a way that's gonna make change. It's um, hard when you're oppressed, overwhelmed, you feel like no one cares about you. I felt that, no one cares about you, you're thrown like garbage, you're on your own, you don't know how to survive, you have to fight everyone and no one will open the door for you. It's I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go straight into activism. I would want to heal and find some shelter and love first, but um, yeah. So like, and, and, and I think that was where Cole Gianni had like such a significant impact in that sense, because not only were they the ones to have done my intake at the Alley 40 Center, um, when this promotion came about, this was the first project she wanted to start. They had said to me, um, Sky, I know that your immigration case is taking a long time and I've noticed that, you know, you've come around and you do participate in groups, but is there like something more that you'd like to do? And it was, you know, simply from a conversation like that, like, you know, noticing my movements and kind of like recommending that there is something that could be done outside of you just going to groups or outside of you just being within a space and not being active. Here's something you could do in the interim. And, you know, they gave me that opportunity to try this advocacy and what were areas that you were introduced to the advocacy? So I, I was really actually just put on a panel. Like, like my first experience what? was at GMHC. They were doing a panel around, like they were doing a panel around housing is healthcare and mm -hmm. you know how that intersects. And I had just gotten into the independent living program at Ali Forney Center, um, which was a 18 month program for you to be able to like, you know, have your own bed and so on and, and shelter. And I thought that, you know, it worked hand in hand because now, now that I was like, you know, sheltered and somewhere like, even though it's temporary, it's a, you know, a longer time than usual within like an, an overnight drop in shelter. So it was kind of like, I was able to focus more on things, knowing that my stuff were secure in somewhere that was locked away for at least 12 hours a day where I know that no one would touch it. Um, and then also like, you know, it was in a relatively safe area. It was like Washington Heights, you know, you had Hudson Park behind there. So, you know, your environment was like so safe. Like if I were to, it was like within that area, like, you know, you had friendly people, you had services that were like, you know, a barbershop down the street, like a check cashing place. So, I mean, as it regards to like accessibility as well, like, you know, like all of that stuff that fits into housing, like a pharmacy to sound the street, like all those places that kind of like interconnect to your health, just having that housing or having that kind of like stability of somewhere to stay, I think is really important. So um, what campaigns within tackling LGBTQ homelessness are you currently focusing on? So I'm starting a campaign with Fierce NYC. Um, the original name that we into- Give us a little context of who Fierce NYC is first. Sure. So. I'm a youth organizer at Fierce NYC. I started in August 2017. Um, however, I've been going there from 2016 as a regular member. Um, so Fierce NYC is actually an acronym, like the word Fierce, um, and it stands for Fabulous Independent Educated Radicals for Community Empowerment. Um, and it's a group of young people between the ages of 13 to 24 who also identify. See, my nail broke off. <laughs> That's fierce, right. <laughs> you know, 
There are a group of young people who are 13 to 24 that identify as LGBTQ youth that are very much interested- Of color. Of color, yeah, specifically important. of color. They are a group of young people who care passionately about the community, especially for LGBTQ community that live within you know, the Bronx and the wider four boroughs of New York City. And they do work around like politically conscious workshops, like, you know, cop watch training, know your rights training, um, you know, immigration and feds and kind of like how that works, but strictly base building and organizing, like how it is that you get people like aware of like the issues that directly impact them and what they need to do or the necessary steps they need to take to correct that. So what are some of the reasons 40% of homeless youth are queer and why are they running from home and why do their parents or guardians reject them? I mean, one of the things that people tend to omit um, outside of the, you know, the stereotypical, oh, my parents don't accept me or don't accept my sexuality is poverty. It's hard for them to now provide services or to send them somewhere else so that they can be feel, you know, feel safe. And youth are uh, like compelled at that time to leave because not only are they don't, they're not in a space that, you know, accommodates for who they are and their identity, but it's also like, you know, I'm now endangering my parents and they can't provide for me in the way that I need to. So, you know, they're forced to leave home. Um, in my situation, uh, you know, my grandparents, they loved me and they still do. It's just that they never really had the knowledge and the understanding of what it means to be LGBTQ. And they had like a lot of like, you know, biases. stories and biases that were just very like, you know, misconstrued, <laughs> misunderstood like miscommunicated and God knows I wasn't the one to communicate that to them. So like it was just, um, you know, the simple fact that they didn't understand and the fear of what would happen to me if they weren't around or if they were on the street surrounded by me. So it was just, it was super crazy. So, you know, sexuality and religion. You and know, gender. And, ge and expression. Oh my gosh. Glad to mention that. Own community doesn't really understand these kind of like, yeah. you know, intersectionalities and how they work and the fact that they're separate, you know, and they're right. not, you know, together. I think so I want to share with you my story. Um, so 2016 in July, no, sorry, June, right before Pride Parade, um, I was going out, it was not even late with my friends in Brooklyn, and I get a text, first a call and then a text that my mom said, you need to find somewhere else to sleep tonight. I was on my way home, it was 10 o'clock, I don't like to stay out late. My mom got frustrated with me because she wanted me to be there for a dinner and she thinks that I am being disrespectful to her when I was just running late. And um, she said, you need to find somewhere else to, and she locked the door. And she made such a 180 as someone who always knew that I was different and always accepted me, but once the label was visible, I'm like, this is who I am she used she's not even a very religious person but she used her religion over me and rejected me and i had found somewhere to go and stay that night someone who i met at a bar and that summer i was in alley borney center and i was in their shelter system and even though it's the safest probably probably one of the safest places for me to be in the world i was also dealing with issues there where people were preventing me from taking a shower in the morning i was not getting the medication that i needed um, case managers were pushing off my therapy appointments to deal with trauma. I lived, my grandmother, who is not my biological grandmother, she really loved me and accepted me and I talked to her and she allowed me to stay with her and I took care of, with her, took care of her and her dog, her walking dog, for over a year until September 2017. And then she got sick and old and she lived with her brother in New Jersey and then I had nowhere else to go and I wasn't emotionally prepared to go back to a shelter because like you said, poverty, like where was I gonna go? My mother kept threatening and pressuring me to change who I am, to give up who I am, to tell me I'm never gonna be something, no one's gonna love you, no one's gonna take you seriously, constantly breaking and shaming me and my brother who like abused me for like over 10 years and really having that trauma of breaking me and breaking me and then when you leave that home, you're reminded by your society how much you're hated and broken. Years ago, literally, my mother um, locked the door again and threatened me and assumed that my behavior is a way to come back on her because she wanted me to be this religious man. And that's not who I am. And she's not even a very religious person, but she wanted me to conform, like many parents do, what she thought was right for her life. 
when this is my life, my body, my gender, and I've struggled with my identity in my own ways and I've suppressed it for a long time, and now I'm pushing in the opposite direction, their system. Um, I struggle finding hope. I struggle finding people who will be sensitive. Mm -hmm. I've had teachers and I have other staff that whenever I told them I'm homeless, they don't give me two minutes for me to process and heal. It's like, oh, why are you late? Oh, um, I have my own problems. I have my own issues. People within the community as well who blamed me and shamed me for my situation when it took me over 10 something years to leave an abusive household. My brother physically abused me, my mother physically, my father verbally, and going to school being shamed and in society and life felt like torture, like real torture. Everywhere I go, I was either physically or emotionally or sexually abused. And everyone told me, keep going, keep going, keep going, and smile. And I said, I can't, I'm angry, I'm hurt, and no one wanted to hear me. I looked like the angry black woman. <laughs> and now I'm on my journey. I don't know where it's taking me, you know, I'm not getting the all the support that I need. I. It's funny you say about like activism motivation, like I, these past few months after being let go again, I needed my time to check out from activist spaces and world issues because I needed to take care of myself and just be lazy and eat and relax and not deal with people's drama. And um, a huge inspiration of a lot of the setup for these episodes was how could I address larger issues and connect it to experiences that I felt that connects me with the community. I mean, I've been very involved with the queer community since 2013. I mean, I was obviously queer, but not completely out growing up in a religious community. And um, here I am doing this work that is not able to be seen or heard elsewhere. You know, we talked about like how queer media would focus on, you know, oh, this celebrity looks hot but not focusing on a great community activist like you and all the great things you're <laughs> doing. You. And the mainstream media only cares about us when it makes them money and they want to look cool, that they want to look progressive. So this is the inspiration for this show. And homelessness is a huge epidemic as someone who's experienced it and as someone who's seen how stigmatized they am. Um, and it's not only a queer issue, I thought it was really important to do this episode today for whatever it's worth. If it does change, if it doesn't, just hoping that someone out there will listen, someone will do something, someone who isn't queer, who is an ally, who is privileged ideally, to help everyone have a safe home where they could finally be loved that they weren't for years. And I think my, my future, my mission, I guess I would like to say with you is um, wherever I live, I hope to open my home to others. There's another like revolutionary person that I met. Um, his name is Mustafa Sullivan spoke about the four agreements and those four agreements kind of framed how it is that I form my relationships and how I look at the world and how I look at people and I also noticed how it changed my whole like aura you know of being and you know those four agreements were one um, be impeccable with your word so being very meaningful and intentional about what you're saying but with love like with appreciation for that person um, this, the other step was, you know, don't take anything personal, which I kind of thought to, thought to be like one of my hardest ones to do, um, to realize that opinionated statements or how people view things or say things, even when it's something compliment or something nice, that it really doesn't have anything to do with you. It has to do with what they originally had formed in their mind or thought was like, you know, something ugly or something cute. But, you know, because you miss that, you, you meet that kind of like, description in their mind and that's what you are so why take that personal especially if it's someone you don't know and you know number three was to not make assumptions and that was interesting because like you know a lot of the times there's a fear in asking and there's a fear in knowing what the truth is so we'd rather as humans just assume and forget that assumption is not truth so you know there was that and then the last agreement is remembering that you know you are human so doing your best at those three things and after reading that I must admit that I kind of you know made a deeper look at myself and realized that even the fact that my grandparents did not accept me at a moment in time they did that based on the predis 
predisposed notion of what they thought mm. homosexuality would be and you know thought that that was going to be me and didn't want that to happen right um and the fact of like not being able to take that even personal and forgiving them right. and being intentional about that forgiveness so that was that was i think thank you a turning point so i want to ask you two last questions before we close up today sure um short answers if you can so where do you see the movement to ending the housing epidemic is leading? Um, it's leading to a more political fight than it is leading to, um, like, say, for instance, like, you know, a grassroots um, aspect. And the reason why I say that is because, you know, now that we're not only facing, you know, the fight from, like, certain CBOs and certain programs, we're facing the fight from landlords where we have programs provisioned to give us vouchers and programs provisioned to give us subs subsidies for housing, but now we're getting a backlash from landlords who are not accepting that. So, you know, one of my major plans is what policies can I create or what policies or what law can I amend to force, you know, landlords and to force, like, you know, these presumably, like, stakeholders to, like, provide space for that community, especially right. runaway homeless youth. So that's that's kind of what I'm looking at. And what are ways in which the public can be more sensitive and aware of the challenges homeless queer youth face? Um, actually, focusing on a non-LGBT mid middle white America, like what can they do? Like that's ideal, but yeah, I think they can donate. You know, <laughs> yes. they can definitely donate. You know, I s I see donate where to whom? Um, so I mean, a first NYC. So it's www.fearsnyc.org. Um, our website is not necessarily up to date. Mm -hmm. However, our donation link always worked, and it still works. Um, and you can donate as much as five dollars because what the donation does is, you know, provide you know an internship, a paid internship to LGBTQ youth in that bracket who don't even have GED, but the simple fact that they are taught to capitalize on their experience and educate people about around like homelessness and what that may mean for someone with that L with that identity and you know within that age group. So I mean that's where your money is going to. I think that's one of the first things that you can think about. But also speaking to one of these youth that identify LGBTQ and have experienced homelessness, you know, talking about what their experience is like and getting that understanding, you know, from a secondhand experience as, as a part to like rumors or speculations of what homeless youth is. So I think those are my advice to them, honestly speaking. Um, because there's never enough money. There's like 1.3 homeless youth in this country, of which 40% identify as LGBTQ. And that's 40% of what we can actually count. You know, because mm. there's couch surfing, there's doubling up, there's homeless youth living in their cars. People are not you out. You know, people are not out. They are like, you know, and sexually that's just trafficked. America. Imagine the and world. The world, you know, and like, you know, in a country that, you know, likes to think it's progressive, which in some ways it is, in some ways it's not. But then also, like, you know, I don't know, Uganda or, you know, African nations yeah. who do not have any of these services whatsoever. No. And Jamaica, we would be who we talked about earlier. Gully. We would be on the streets. We would be attacked with no one like to help us. Like police officers Hate. tear gas them on a daily killing. basis. Killing. Nobody you would know, care. Killing. You know, their bodies are put in the morgue and the, they're thrown because there's nobody that wants to even go and it's identify them. It's such a privilege for people who are not queer how they could just walk and roam, I mean, depending on who, how you identify who you are, to walk in the world and not be constantly attacked for who you are and not to be constantly threatened and be someone wants to kill you and just for existing. Thank you, Sky, for all the great work you do on behalf of the so queer fun. community. I really bless you to find renewed energy on your journey of justice and that we could see more leaders like you in the world. Um, we will do our best on queer justice to follow your legacy and highlight any future work you're doing. Thank you so much you again. So Sky and I's experience with homelessness and the adversity we face in a world that stigmatizes our identities and believes we do not deserve a roof over our head is two out of millions of youth and adults across the world, whether they're queer or not, who are or have faced housing instability. I hope this conversation today will prompt you to further educate yourself about social barriers around homelessness that prevents people from living independent and healthy full lives. In the description in our video on YouTube, we will list a few organizations that could guide you on this important work 
for you to further engage and take part of providing a safe and affirming shelter for another human being.